that is a wonderful invitation. I really like it. This is a self-portrait. That's the five o'clock shadow. I always enjoyed that bit. He's worked with the greatest children's writer of all time, by which I mean Roald Dahl. He's a writer too, you know. Is there no end to his talent? Answer, no. There are a lot of drawings. Sometimes I actually draw in bed before I've even got up. I think we need a bit more hair. I remember Quentin on Jackanory and seeing this man sort of doing these amazing pictures. His work is appealing to grandmas, to parents and to kids. His pictures look as if there is no effort involved, but his skill in drawing is immense. He was able to just break away from what we know him for. He does these murals at hospitals, and they're fantastic. He still has that mysterious internal drive to make pictures in new ways. These are white shoes, such as I'm wearing at the moment. I know what I should do. That means that's me. How's that? What I'm doing is a picture of different things I've worked on. This green paint is a sort of landscape where things are going to happen. What makes being an illustrator so interesting to me is that different authors take you into different situations and you find you have to do something you hadn't thought of before. You take on something of the character of their book This is Dennis. He is the boy in the dress. This is the first book I did with David Walliams. I don't think I'd be a successful children's author today if it wasn't for Quentin. I'm amazed that I even got to meet him, let alone work with him. With my first book, I just had an idea for a story. I thought, what would happen if a boy dressed up as a girl and went to school? I found the publishers, and they said, who would you like to illustrate it? And I said, well, the dream is Quentin Blake, but he's never going to do it. I will confess that I wasn't sure, because people in show business do write books sometimes because they think they ought to. And so I rather tentatively read it, and I thought, my goodness, this is the real thing. You know, it was absolutely wonderful. He wanted to illustrate it, and I was absolutely over the moon. So I asked if we could meet, and then we went and had tea together, which was super exciting. I was just beaming, because his work meant so much to me over the years, and also because he is like one of his illustrations come to life. For some reason, he looks exactly like he's been drawn by Quentin Blake. It was very nice, because I, I felt I knew what Dennis looked like, and when David Wallace saw it, he knew that was what he looked like, which was, you know, and he said, oh, that's him, all right. He showed me the picture of Dennis that he'd done for the cover of the book, and I had, like, tears in my eyes because I couldn't believe just how sympathetic he'd made the character. He was like, well, is this OK? And I was like, yes, it's brilliant. And, of course, he's Quentin Blake, so you don't need to stand over him while he does his illustrations. He knows what he's doing. He's done, at that point, it was sort of like hundreds of children's books. So he was left to get on with it. The fundamental collaboration is the co collaboration with the words, the co collaboration with the story. And with this, it was all there in the book. 
somehow it revives my own sense of what it was like being, being a schoolboy, you know. That helped me along. So I could just draw kids in school uniform walking about and talking to each other. There's humour in them. But they're kind of naturalistic drawings, actually, if you look at them. Somehow, with the relatively small amount of ink he uses, he tells complex stories. Really, it's very sort of limited, his resources. It's a piece of paper and a, and, and a scratchy ink pen. And even though there isn't a huge amount of detail necessarily in terms of the background, or he's not necessarily going to do, you know, every line on someone's face, he goes straight to the truth of a character. Dennis wants to find out what it's like being a girl. Um, and that's what's so interesting about it. It's not just about dressing up. It's Dennis trying to be a girl. Lisa adjusted the dress expertly before silently leading Dennis to the mirror. Dennis gazed at himself. For a moment, he was shocked by what he saw. Then the shock turned to wonder, and he laughed. He felt so happy he wanted to dance. Sometimes you feel things so deeply that words aren't enough. What's amazing is how tender Quentin's illustrations are, and he really turns this into an emotional moment. It could have just been perhaps a funny moment or a silly moment, but he makes it really heartfelt. I think he's got an incredible eye for the outsider, and I think perhaps he's drawn to those stories and those characters more than any others. One of the things that appealed to me about the boy in the dress was that in some way it was a world that I knew. It was a suburban life where things are boring. That's where I came from. I was born in Sidcup in 1932. It was perfect suburbia with semi-detached, pebble-dashed houses. There was no tradition at all of art at home. I mean, my father was a civil servant and my mother was a housewife. Almost everything I got, I got through school. By the time I went to secondary school, I think I could draw quite well. I first had a drawing published in 1949. I was still at school at the time, and I used to submit drawings to Punch, and to have something printed was a real step in the direction of becoming an illustrator. I didn't go to an art school. In fact, I went to Cambridge and I read English there. I don't regret that, because learning to read books has a lot to do with what I've done ever since. What I did do was go to life classes a couple of times a week. I would draw from the model, and then you turn around and then you draw what you can remember, which alters it all. And then you go home and you do it again. If you draw something which is in front of you, the amount of visual information which you're offered is too much to deal with. And I think if you go away, then you discover there's some feeling which you can get down on paper. It isn't only the technical information. The observation that I did in life classes for two years seems to have lasted me ever since. I never look at something that I need to draw. I have no reference, I just feel I know what happens, you know, kind of thing. It may not be anatomically absolutely perfect, but it just comes out of the imagination or the old observations, unconscious observations of the past. really starts working in earnest as an illustrator in the late 50s, early 60s. He keeps working for Punch, he did cartoons, but also cover designs. He did a lot of experimental image making, working for publishers like Penguin, trying to encapsulate the subject of uh, an Evelyn Waugh novel, for example, or Kingsley Amis, people like that. But really, probably the most important work for him at that early time was A Drink of Water.
this is the book which has a special significance for me, which was first published 60 years ago. I find that hard to believe. And it's the first book that I illustrated. I wanted to see my drawings in sequence and not having to compete with other people's drawings. So I said to my friend John Yeoman, do you think you could write something for me? Oh, there's a bear with a baby, oh, that's right. What is fascinating about children's books, there's so many opportunities in them. That is partly why I started to do them. There's a freedom in children's books, especially at that time. It's almost like a place that you can go and do anything. And I think that's a really liberating thing for Quentin. So I'd written some poems, uh, this was in the early 70s, and the publishers conjured up the idea that uh, Quentin's drawings would go very well with them. And the poems are about my childhood. Um, they were about sharing a bedroom and whacking my brother over the head with a pillow and being ticked off by my dad and that sort of thing. The idea that you wrote about childhood in a sort of rumbustious sort of way, that was a bit new. I was enjoying naughtiness. And Quentin picked up on that. We were very much on the same wavelength. A lot of the books I read were illustrated by Quentin. So I think that drew me towards this job called being an illustrator. I was taught to read with the Ladybird keywords reading scheme. I wasn't a, a natural reader. Um, I struggled to acquire this very difficult thing called uh, literacy. And then I remember seeing this amazing book called Agaton Sachs and the Diamond Thieves. And I thought, wow, that looks interesting. I wanted to know the story that this image was illustrating. And when I opened this book, I decoded sentences that were far more difficult than Peter and Jane and Tea with Mummy because they had Quentin's drawings next to them. And I went to my teacher, I said, I want some more books like this. And so the world was opened up and Quentin was the great guide. Due to a mix-up at the roller skating rink, Mortimer the Raven had been taken to Auntie Brenda's house by mistake. I remember with great affection on a show called Jack and Nori, Joan Aitken's stories about Arabelle, and she has a, a raven called Mortimer, and he gets himself into trouble quite a lot. Mortimer didn't care for coffee. He flew straight out of the window. There was something quite anarchic about Quentin's drawings, the way he draws birds, and I know he loves drawing birds. His birds have great personality. I was always interested myself in drawing, and I learnt a lot from the way he managed to animate his characters. For the programme Jack and Ori, I even did some stories which I wrote so that you could actually draw them while you were telling them. Hello. The story I'm going to tell you today is called Lester and the Wibbly Wobbly Business. But first of all, you need to know about Lester. I remember watching Quentin draw live on Jack and Ori and being completely mesmerised by his facility and the way that he could really give the characters such life. Occasionally I do uh, books of my own where I invent my own characters and write the story. I'm interested in different ways of telling stories. You know, so that's rather fascinating to me. This is one of my own, the story of the dancing frog. 
This young woman, her husband has been lost at sea, and she finds this frog dancing on a lily pad. And then we don't know quite how it happened, but the frog went on stage. In Paris, George danced with a girl dressed in feathers, and the audience went wild with excitement. In Russia, he danced in a special version of Swan Lake. Sometimes you discover things in books which you didn't know were going to be there. I realised afterwards that she'd taken like, this frog to help her cope with bereavement. It's a story about stories as well and how they can help you. Um, so it started from a frog, but it ended up being a lot of other things. I think people quite often forget that Quentin is actually a very funny and clever writer. People think that it's really easy to write a children's book. And actually, it's like a really difficult puzzle. Because you can only have so many words, you have to pick every word carefully. And Quentin does it in a wonderful way. Mr Magnolia has only one boat. It's about one character, Mr Magnolia, and various things about him. And there's not very much story, but there are certain things that happen in it. He gives rides to his friends when he goes for a scoot. And the splash is immense when he comes down the chute. But Mr Magnolia has only one boot. Young children, they prick up their ears when they hear something that plays with the sound of things. And it's done in this butter ta 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 a uh, beautiful rhythm. Just look at the way he juggles with fruit. The mice all march past as he takes the salute. And his dinosaur is a magnificent brute. He's got these parakeets that he holes in his suit. <laughs> He's not quite sure what's going on round the back there, <laughs> see. But Mr Magnolia, poor Mr Magnolia, has only one boot. Quite often in Quentin's work, there's a sort of element of performance and art that enables people to survive and enjoy things. Mr. Magnolia, he's expressing himself through dance, and that's why he doesn't mind having only one boot. He's saying, really, that there is a wonderful power in art to cure and to heal and to help. Quentin loves these characters who are slightly eccentric, Appreciating difference, I think, is something that his picture books do. Now we're in the studio where I do the finished drawings for every book. This is a book called Mrs Armitage that I did the words for myself. Mrs Armitage was out on her bicycle. Mrs Armitage is just going on a bicycle with her doggy. A hedgehog walked across the road. Now the hedgehog in the way of a bike, the bicycle. What this bike really needs, said Mrs Armitage, is a really loud horn. Mrs Armitage watched three horns. They were very loud. Beep, beep, honk, honk. <laughs> to me, it's quite clear that Mrs Armitage is to encourage people to have a go at something and then embellish it. We have a bicycle, and now what we need is a bell, or a hooter, or a megaphone, or some flags. And that is saying, get out there, give it a whirl, and be uninhibited. Quite often you want to be able to show that people are in movement, and if you've got a scarf which comes whirling out behind, it gives the sort of idea that they're, they're going along. There's a sense of mischief, and there's a sense that it, it's actually rather a good thing to be disruptive. For the scarf, I don't mind if it doesn't quite fit the lines, because I think that makes it feel as though it's something happening and sweeping past. It's not too sort of fixed. My love of Quentin Blake's work sparked the fire for me to pursue this career 100%. 100%. One of my favorite of his is Zagazoo. It's wild, like, it's absolutely wild. It's a story about parenting 
and he's just made it into this crazy, fantastical thing. Zagazu was not quite perfect, but his happy smile seemed to make up for that. And then, one day, George and Bella got up in the morning and discovered that Zagazu had changed into a huge baby vulture. Zagazu is such a true representation of how much your life has changed by having a baby in the house. Its screeches were terrifying. They were even worse at night. I read it to my daughter, who's two and a quarter, and she was transfixed by it. But as a parent reading it, it felt very um, gratifying to be seen and to be understood. They got up one morning and discovered that Zagazu had changed into a small elephant. Smashing into everything, crashing around. Uh, and I should say, yes, yes, that's something I'm living through. And then as it grows again, it becomes other animals. Until it becomes a dragon, I believe, at one stage. He scorched the carpet. He set light to the cardigan of an old lady who'd come to sell raffle tickets. This is absolutely no insult to my daughter, but I feel like I've really lived through that. But then, one morning, they got up, and Zagazu had changed into a strange, hairy creature. Oh, no, said Bella. I preferred the elephant. When he becomes a teenager, he is at his most monstrous. If I'd had any children, I would have known too much about it to be able to do it. But because I hadn't and had only seen these things from afar, I could simplify it. I'm reading that and I'm learning the potential for different ways of storytelling, how to layer your story. And then also the sort of busyness, the energy that Quentin Blake manages to capture in the line work, it just translates so well to the story. It looks like it's quite chaotic, but it's really well thought out. Like, if you removed a few lines, the picture would change completely and it just wouldn't work. Concentrated chaos, that's what I call it. This time we're going to see someone very important to me. Those are ears in silhouette. We'll make it at night, there's the moon. And this is the BFG. I mean, the curious thing about the BFG is it's a book I've illustrated twice. I started it in one style, and I did a dozen pictures, which is what the publishers asked me to do. And then Roald Dahl took a look at them. And the message came, he's not happy. Um, and, and you knew if Roald wasn't happy. As I've said, I don't generally talk to authors a great deal. I relate to the text. But in this case, we had an emergency situation. And so I went to his home with Great Missenden and we talked about it. The first ones I'd done were these. These are old friends. And there is the, uh, the BFG, sort of slightly scratchy line drawing with the big ears all right. I'm interested to see this again. He, he, wasn't, old, he wasn't happy with the drawings. He liked them all right, but there weren't enough of them. I've had dinner with Rod, started talking to him about it. And what happened was then that we started again. We talked a lot about the, the costume. So when I first drew the BFG, he's wearing an apron and, and boots, and that was a costume mentioned in the text. But of course, he wears it in every picture of the book. <laughs> and that's where we, 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 one started to find that it was inconvenient, it was difficult for him to run, and so on and so on. And these are some drawings that I did. He sat at the dinner table, and here the BFG's got a sort of sack round his waist and a belt. and. He's got some kind of a, a vest there. And he had a sort of hat as well, a sort of cap. There were many sketches of the BFG with an apron and without an apron, and then, no, that wasn't right. What about a waistcoat and all the rest of it? And that was all done over very jolly dinners on our big dining room table. 
to watch Quentin with a pad of paper and Raul talking about the book and the characters in it. The pencil contained magic. I was so lucky to watch that. We eventually arrived at the costume that you see in the, in the drawings now, except we couldn't decide what he was going to wear on his feet. We didn't want these big Wellington boots, so I went home and then um, a sort of shapeless brown paper parcel arrived, so, you know, tied with, with string, and I opened it and this is what was in it. And, of course, it's one of Rod's own sandals. It's Norwegian, I think. I've never seen them anywhere else. That was his origins, and that's what the BFG wears. You get a sense of how close they are, in a way, to each other. It's one of his characters with which I'm sure he feels the, the most affinity. And it meant that the BFG, as I drew him, became more like a real person. I can remember he did say, when people talk about the BFG, they see what Quint draws, you see, um, um, uh, which, was, which was very nice of him. There were many good things about working with Rod. In certain situations, I think he could be difficult, but we got on very well. Really, Rahl and Quentin were like a pair of comedians. They were an odd couple. Rahl is a very different sort of person from me, and in a way, that was good, I think, you know, because if you're, if you're, if you're a double act, you don't want to be two versions of the same person. There's that contrast and a slight sort of tension almost. Dahl's stories are occasionally quite misanthropic, but somehow Quentin brings a kind of lightness and playfulness. <laughs> Even in really scary moments, you know, like something like the witches, he still can find humor. Quentin Blake is so good at making monsters real. That is sort of influential on a whole generation of children's imaginations. I'm thinking about when I read Roald Dahl's adaptations of fairy tales, um, and in particular, The Wolf. As soon as Wolf began to feel that he would like a decent meal, he went and knocked on Grandma's door. When Grandma opened it, she saw the sharp white teeth, the horrid grin, and Wolfie said, may I come in? What's good is they're playful enough that it's not um, genuinely traumatising, <laughs> but they're bad enough that it is quite scary. I think children quite like to be frightened, and I think Ra thought that at moments, you know, and it toughens them up. I mean, the classic example, they did a safety guide for children on railways, and there's really quite a horrific picture of a child who's put its head out of the window. But it's just, you take one look at it and you shriek with laughter. The story of James and the Giant Peach contains two of the most revolting people that Roald Dahl ever created, who are Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker, who I've played. Quentin wasn't the first to draw Aunt Spiker to illustrate her. The illustrations I've seen by the other artists are more complete with cross-hatching and very detailed work. But from Quentin, we got the spikiness of Aunt Spiker. And there was something about the shorthand nature of Quentin's um, illustrations that really caught me. There's a ghastly picture of Spiker with greed and menace letting people in with their ticket stubs. And so I based a lot of my performance on that. I wonder if it shone through, I don't know. I don't know, but in my head was Quentin's Aunt Spiker. George's Marvelous Medicine. There was something about the illustrations that made me go, yeah, that's, that's what grandmas look like, and that's exactly what you want to do to them if they're really getting on your nerves. I think the image that really stands out in my head is when she grew and grew and grew, and the head is popping out over the roof of the house. 
that imagery really sort of bleeds into your reality. And I just got memories of being in the back garden and thinking, yeah, I could definitely see a neck popping out of that house. Quinton Blake's illustrations are so childlike and so simple, it almost leaves the reader the opportunity to fill in some of the blanks. There's still room for you to interpret it, and it brings you into that different imaginative world. Ra was often asked, how can you write these things for children? And he said, I've never forgotten what it was like to be a child. And I think Quentin is possibly the same. Sometimes people say to you, you seem to understand children very well or something like that. And you say, well, I don't, of course. I've never been married, I've never had any children. It's not a question of knowing about children, but you be them. What I feel about illustration is it's like acting, so that you don't look at people to see what they're doing. You don't have models to look at. You imagine you are that person. If it's a dog, if it's an old age pensioner, I'm trying to be them as well. You know when you're, perhaps when you're acting, mm. and somebody says, be angry or mm. be happy or pretend you've got a limp or something like that, you don't really know how you do it, do you? No. You just want to do it. Right. And so you try and produce that feeling yes. or you make those expressions. I can imagine things happening and I actually kind of mime them when I'm drawing them. And I've been told I make the faces of the people in the pictures. So it is like a, a kind of acting. He is able to populate the page with characters. He has to think about those characters as an actor would. Figure out who they are, what it is about them that he wants to communicate. Those pictures are full of heart. How do you draw that? They're full of spirit. And these emotions will be conveyed with dots and a squiggle to invest what few lines there are there with such life is masterful. We got here. It's a book and they're on it. And this is a sort of um, metaphorical, symbolical way of saying that I like to think of books taking people away, not just to places, but to experience about how, how other people feel and live and react. It's about how to live more. <laughs> you might not know, but I've done a lot of drawings in hospitals. I was invited to do some pictures for a place for elderly people with mental health problems. That's where I started. So I did a lot of pictures of uh, people climbing about in trees, mostly, actually, and uh, it seemed to work for them. We gave Quentin quite a loose brief. We said to him we would like pictures of older people enjoying themselves. The things that are happening in the pictures are things that people in their 70s and 80s may no longer be doing in reality, but Quentin said they are still doing them in their minds, in their imaginations. In one case, an old lady swinging from branch to branch among the trees. And the patients loved that. They, they chuckled at the pictures in delight. Often hospitals and clinic buildings can be depressing, unfriendly, institutional places. And if you can make somebody laugh and smile while they're passing down the corridor, I think you've achieved something quite important. It was very touching because, I mean, there was an elderly lady, not quite like this. She said, oh, they encourage us to do all the things we're not supposed to do. It's wonderful. The 
the Rosie Birth Centre in Cambridge. We have pools in each room and kindly Quentin Blake made us some pictures of mothers and babies in water. And our ladies, when they're lying in the pool, in very strong labour often, find them very comforting and very relaxing. They're just very soft. Some people think it's seaweed, some people think it's umbilical cord around the baby, and it really, really helps them. The Rosie Centre is where we welcomed both of our babies into the world. I think it was virtually straight away that we it's noticed it was Quentin Blake. In, it's such we noticed that it's Quentin Blake. It's so easily identifiable. You don't get a much more momentous day in your life ever going to have a baby and also a little bit scary. And so the fact that there is something so familiar is, is really quite nice and comforting. Giving birth, the word used is labour. My scenes are after that. So they are free. They're not held down by any of the paraphernalia of the hospital. And what they're doing is meeting their child. It depicts it so nicely, actually. It's this beautiful moment with these outstretched arms and a baby just sort of flying towards you. And, um, and yeah, it, when you're sitting there holding this newborn child in your arms, it does really reflect that experience. Quentin's picked up on what women do with their babies when they see them, actually, because they gaze and gaze and gaze before they do touching very often. And we see this gaze all the time. Quentin Blake's been a constant in our lives as children looking at, at pictures in Roald Dahl books and things like that. We now have some Quentin Blake books, which we really enjoy reading with Morgan. The Circle of Life with the continuation of Quentin Blake. Each of the hospital projects is sort of illustration job in that you have to address the situation and find out what the appropriate answer is. So, Welcome to Planet Zog goes in a waiting room for children. The hospital is an alien environment, and so Planet Zog is another strange environment, but it's all right. There are aliens with several legs and that kind of thing in there that correspond to the doctors and consultants, and they're having their leg bandaged as well. And so, really, it's a quite simple message. Yes, it's an alien environment, but the aliens can be quite nice. At the Child Development Centre in Hillingdon, we look after children with additional or social communication needs. Um, so going into an area like ours can be quite scary. It's different. They may never have been there before. Quentin Blake's artwork is something that's friendly and something to distract them. And for some of them, they might not read, but the visual can be so important. There's a picture of a tree around where our scales are. And with the kids, trying to get them to stand still when you're putting something on their head can make them quite anxious. So I say, oh, can you see the owl on the tree in front of you? And that will get them looking at something just for long enough for me to quickly bring it down and do a height. Um, and also, when we're going into the rooms, rather than having room numbers, we've got Quentin Blake animals. So you can say to them, can you go and find the room with the blue doggy on it? And they're nice and low if they're at small child height working in the NHS, some days are difficult. But, you know, I will often just take five minutes and on my way out, I will go past the artwork. It just brings that sense of joy, a little bit of happiness. It makes you smile. I've taught an illustration at the Royal College of Art for over 20 years. And what was nice about teaching at the RCA was talking to people about every kind of illustration. When he first arrived at the college, it was the swinging 60s, and they were very raucous days. The Royal College then, it was a melting pot, and he gave us license, he encouraged us to seek what we were best at. Quentin became my tutor when I went to the Royal College of Art in 1981. I'm not technically 
a, a wonderful drawer. I can't draw what's in front of me beautifully and all of that. And I learned from Quentin very much that, that it was fine to, to just do your own kind of way of drawing and that it was your own sort of handwriting, your own voice that was important. It doesn't matter too much if the arms get a bit too long. It's more important to capture the essence of what you were drawing. He gave me so many tricks and so many brilliant suggestions all the way through. I mean, just little things like, have you thought about using a different kind of paper? I been doing children's books ever since. I often think if it wasn't for Quentin, I'd probably be living in a skip. He saw me struggling with kind of penciling a drawing and then rubbing it out and penciling it a bit differently and, get it, and the drawing getting more and more stiff. So he suggested the way that he worked, which was basically to do a really sketchy, lively rough. And then put it on the light box, put sheets of paper on top use your rough as a guide and just do a lively drawing again in ink. Not trace it, that's crucially the case. And it works wonderfully because it allowed me to kind of keep the freshness of a, of a, of a first drawing. And it's the technique that I've used my whole career. I found myself teaching students of illustration what has happened in the past. I'm particularly interested in 19th century illustrators. Those are my ancestors, I think, and that's how I regard them. This is a book that I bought when I was 16, and it's a book of pictures by the French illustrator Honoré Daumier. They're all about Paris life. From, he's got a, yes, right. Sorry, um, Par uh, I'm, I'm getting distracted already by the pictures that what is fascinating about them is that this is someone who draws with all the knowledge and quality of, of an old master and you can buy it in a newspaper. And they were tremendously influential to me. I mean, I wish I could do anything like it. And I bought this book for two guineas. And I remember my mother saying to, are you sure you want to spend all that amount of money on a book? Well, I was absolutely right, but I've had it ever since, and I still look at it. Those popular magazines were printed just in black and white, so illustrators just had their black line. Possibly what Quentin might have learned from those things is to say a lot with very little. Quentin's work stands, I think, absolutely up there with the grand Victorian illustrators. John Tenniel, for instance, who produced these beautiful cross-hatched landscapes of intricacy. Quentin can do that imaginatively with two lines. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand of the grindstone Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Somehow or other, we've marginalised the tradition of illustrations, artwork, with literature. But Quentin has been very keen to try and bring that back and to show its value. Those of us who've been influenced by Quentin share that ideology, that there is no such thing as a book that isn't made better with illustration. And he's illustrated many books that are not for children but they still have all that exuberance and that power that he brings to the work he does. He's more appreciated for that in France, where they call him Contemblec, than he has been in this country. We have quite a, a long connection with France. I, I've done a lot of work there, so I'm very interested in French literature, and I did The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the two books by Cyrano de Bergerac, Voltaire's Candide, it's full of very nice things to do, with uh, Dr. Pangloss being hanged, for instance, and to show the clerical people, you know, being hypocritical about it. <laughs> Quentin Black, he, he's embraced French culture so deeply. And I've seen a lot of interpretations and illustrations of Candide by Voltaire, but I've never, never seen anything as true and strong a lot of people indeed didn't know that he could do tragedy and he could do social satire.
Quentin. Quentin is hugely popular in France. He has a very witty sense of observation, which goes with the French sense of irony and sarcasm, but always with this kindness and this generosity and this benevolence. What I'm rather pleased in a way is, is I seem to be bringing the illustration style of drawing into more serious works. This is a drawing that is like some other drawings that I've done that don't relate to a particular story or a text, but I did them because I wanted to do something that reflected the, well, the distresses that we read about all the time. I have a whole exhibition of them at the moment, which is called We Live in Worrying Times. The show opened for a day before lockdown, so suddenly the title seemed awfully appropriate. Hastings Contemporary has a focus on modern art. I think what we have celebrated is Quentin Blake, the artist. He has a very serious edge. I think we always associate Quentin with this sort of joyous celebration of humanity. And in all of those children's illustrations, everyone is looking pretty happy. Yet we look at these works and it's, it's really hard to say how these people are feeling. We're looking at moments of reflection, of pensive thinking, of vulnerability. Something is not quite right here. What we see is the amazing freedom of someone who is accomplished as a draftsman and accomplished in the study of humanity. They are called unfortunates, and you don't know precisely what their distress is. The stories are implied. What's fascinating to me about it, it's like the opposite of illustration in a sense, in that in an illustration, you are reading about somebody and you're trying to imagine what she looks like and draw that. In these, you start drawing and you find that person. And so it's, it's sort of like illustration in reverse, really. The centerpiece of this exhibition is the taxi driver, which is this huge mural, 30 foot long. In a sense, it was commissioned because I sent for a London cab, you know, a taxi to, to, to take me somewhere in a couple of years ago. And I got in and the taxi driver got in after me and sat down opposite and said, we live in worrying times. And I didn't know what was going on. And he said he'd seen Picasso's Guernica a couple of times in Spain. He said, and what we need is a Guernica for today, he said, and you are the person to do it. And I said, I'm quite sure that's my kind of thing. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. Whilst one can't say it's a direct comparison to Picasso, Quentin's work has that sense of an epic in monochrome tones dealing with war-torn places and the dislocation that we've seen throughout the globe. I think for many artists, there must come a sense of reflection with age. There's something about the passing of time that styles can loosen up. And certainly for Quentin, he has been able to capture with confidence some of the darker aspects of life. I found things that I could explore there that I hadn't done before. I mean, and it's partly age, I expect, as I was anything else. I'm not so committed to, um, to cheering everybody up, you know. We do live in worrying times. And the scene may be gloomy, but the, the life is in the drawing. You hope that there's energy in the way you do it. For me, the most powerful book that Quentin has ever worked on is Michael Rosen's sad book. 
I mean, it's absolutely heartbreaking because Michael is writing about the loss of his, of his young son. And what's incredible is that this is a book that can be read by children, but there's nothing kind of kidsy about it. Sometimes sad is very big. It's everywhere, all over me. What makes me most sad is when I think about my son, Eddie. He died. I loved him very, very much, but he died anyway. I just thought it was one of the most moving books I'd ever read. And Quentin is being called upon to do illustrations he wouldn't normally do. He's depicting the loss of a child and, you know, it's a pain that's unimaginable. It begins with, his, with him saying, this is me, I'm trying to look happy because I think people won't like me if I look sad. And so you have to draw that picture of him. This is me being sad. Maybe you think I'm being happy in this picture. Really, I'm being sad, but pretending I'm being happy. I did it about 14 or 15 times, I must say. I mean, sometimes do drawings two or three times, but I did that more often than any other drawing I've ever done. That picture, apparently, lots of people in bereavement groups and therapy of one sort or another use it to talk about the fact that they put on this face. They've been walking around saying, I'm fine, um, but in actual fact, they're hurting. You can't be more profound than that, can you? The idea that art could enable you to talk about stuff that you've never talked about. It's as if these pictures are saying, I understand. Just like when you read a book, you can feel understood. So when you look at a picture, it's like the drawings that he does for the clinic that treats eating disorders. There's so much kindness in those drawings. I've had anorexia nervosa for five years, going on six now. So I went to um, Vincent Square unit in um, Westminster and Chelsea. And yeah, it's basically where you go as a last resort. It's very much to keep you alive. The whole unit was very empty and very clinical. But the only bit of color in the entire unit were Blake's artworks. I decided what they needed was to be ordinary, and just ordinary everyday life. Um, so, I mean, here, this one is a picture of just walking along the street in the rain. That's every day, isn't it? You know, I mean, we, we do that, the, the two of us there. They are the everyday, like, mundane things, but it's trying to peel back the layers of the illness and get back to, like, I don't know, the normality again, really. His pieces are done with kindness, and you can see that and feel it from looking at them. His works definitely show small acts of love. The whole basis of this illness is kind of being, feeling alone, and companionship of others helps you get better. Um, and his work, I think, quietly said that. The technique is fairly naturalistic. They are drawn with one of these quills so that they, they, they're soft and broken so that the, some of the message is in the way the picture is drawn as well as what's drawn. The one that does stand out a lot is the self-portrait where she's smiling at the portrait that she's done. There is definitely, yeah, acceptance in it um, and a huge part of getting better from this illness is learning to accept yourself. So I now like do things that a normal 23-year-old would do, which was a year ago completely unheard of. So very much more in the ordinary life realms of Quentin Blake. I think one of his works had someone doing their laundry and I do that kind of stuff now. <laughs> Adulting, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Africa is a huge amount of illustration which nobody knows about. It's regarded, in a sense, as ephemeral. I thought it would be wonderful to have a space in which those things could be shown. It's taken some time, but the fact that it's actually happening is wonderful. Here we are, physically at this moment, and in the picture in our building, and I'm extremely happy about that. The reason why Quentin wanted to set up that gallery was he wants illustration to be up there with other art forms. And there was nowhere that had, as he said, illustration above the door. It'll open in a couple of years, which will certainly will have the flags out. And uh, it will be the biggest space devoted to illustration probably in the world. It's a language which everybody understands. They may look at it and not think that they're looking at art, but it's having the effect on them of art. And so that will have a home here. It's very nice for me to see different aspects of things that I've done brought together. I probably never got as much drawing done in a day, I should think. <laughs> I'm extremely grateful that I've had the opportunity of doing that variety of work and taken drawing into many different situations. About 20 years ago, um, I did a drawing of myself and it said, from now on, the rules of semi-retirement will come into play and there will be a lot of saying no. That was 1998, and, and I haven't stopped since. I, I perhaps do less commissioned work now, but there's no question of stopping drawing, no. I don't think Quentin's capable of retiring. Drawing is like breathing to him. That's what he does. The thing that's extraordinary now is he cannot stop. It's almost obsessive. He has to be drawing. And if he wakes up too early, uh, say, 2.30 in the morning, oh, I'm bored, he says, he starts drawing. If you leave him in a restaurant, he's drawn on all the napkins, or he's done a drawing in chocolate on the... He never stops. I sat yesterday morning in the studio doing a whole sequence of imaginary portraits of women, and come lunchtime, I counted them, and there were 54 rather to my surprise. So uh, I'm probably doing more drawing than ever, I think.